Welcome to the Philly Sports Dish. We are back for another week. And did anything interesting happen in Philadelphia last night? <laughs> Much ado about nothing. <laughs> Who showed up? Kangaroo Jack is back. Who shows up? <laughs> talk about it. Let's talk about it. <clears throat> Guess who showed up last night at the preseason game? Ben Simmons. Um, I think it's an understatement to say he overplayed his hand. Um, listen, I'm happy he's back. I'm happy that the Sixers didn't trade him for 50 cents on a dollar. Hopefully they can, you know, come to a, a consensus and figure out where they go from here. And as I said before, this all, everybody get on the same page. I felt like, you know, everybody had their own agenda. So if the big picture is to trade them, I always start coming back and playing and getting that nasty taste out of everybody's mouth. Mm -hmm would serve the purpose. So come in, play well for a week or two, and if you want to sit out, I, I I get it. But I'm pretty sure the Sixers said, look, come in, let's get your, let's get your draft value up. And I think the Sixers are still, they still want to trade them. I think they're going to say, mm -hmm. oh, we want them. And that's just another thing to, to drive the trade value up, to let other teams know, hey, we're, we're content with keeping them here. Are you concerned about him pulling the Harding now that he's back? No, because... If he plays well for a week or so, then I, I thought that should have been a strategy from the start. Come in, get a triple double, or you know, shoot seventy percent from the free throw line, and all right, trade me. Yeah. So let me ask you this: How about Rich Paul and how Rich Paul's handled this? Um, see, being as though Ben just showed up last night, it kind of makes me think, you know, it, it kind of lets Rich Paul off the hook because yeah. you know it seems like Ben is just kind of like now, you know, flying by the seat of his pants. Yeah, and let me, yeah. So what we're hearing is that, and I'm I'm a little vexed because what we're hearing is that, like, not even Rich Paul was sure that this was going to happen, but he just showed up. Yeah, but I mean, behind the scenes, it's been reported that Rich Paul and the Sixers have been trying to work mm -hmm. to get him here. So I think Rich Paul was always on board with getting him here because, the Sixers have shown that they weren't going to budge. So once uh, I think Rich Paul and they can't realize that they couldn't, for lack of a better term, bully the Sixers, now what's your pivot? What's, what's your plan B? And I think plan B was, okay, unless you're willing to continue to lose money, you have to go in. Yeah, and those 18 to $22 million mansions don't pay for themselves. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? And the groundskeeping crew and all of that stuff just to operate a place like that. You know, Ben likes to spend money. Yeah. And, and, so. and now to me, I know everybody is saying, you know, he owes the city an apology. And, you know, what is it? Listen, it's going to be interesting to see the locker room dynamic. But if there's one thing I think Doc Rivers is good at, it's talking. <laughs> it's all oh, yeah. like, so <laughs> it ain't coaching. I, I I think in that respect, I'm happy he's the head coach because I think he might be able to at least make it amicable. Now, anything besides that, I don't know. Like that's the thing where he has to go in there and apologize to his teammates. Yeah, and we were just talking off camera about you know a lot of trickles that come out of Sixers camp that Ben is actually very aloof. Mm -hmm. So if he's an aloof person who doesn't have close connections with the teammates, his teammates anyway, what's going to change? Um, Hopefully taking responsibility. And and I think that's all you want man to man is for him to come in and just say, you know what? My bad. You know, I, I, I misplayed that. You know, I, I needed to take that shot at the end and I needed to own it. And that's it. Like you, like as a man, like you don't want like it, it. It's it's a business setting. You know, it's a job. Like he doesn't have to, you know, get on his knees and beg for forgiveness. Yeah. Just own own just whatever mistake you made, and that's it. And as if another man or somebody can't accept that, well, you don't owe him no more than that. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, um, you know, when Embiid and other players talked about when they wanted to actually have this conversation with him mm -hmm. uh, over a month ago, and he told them you know, to stay home. And I think there needs to be a discussion about that because that's antisocial behavior. And once again, he has to own that. He has to explain why he didn't want to take 
the meeting at that time. And I think, you know, if you're going to keep an open mind and listen to him, and if if he says, you know, I was hurting or I felt like, you know, I was let down or you guys didn't have my back. And if you're Doc Rivers and you feel like, OK, I, I shouldn't have said that or if you and be like, OK, I shouldn't have said that. So if everybody say, you know what, I take responsibility for the role I played in it, because usually when things turn out well, when you have that meeting and you say what you did wrong, normally the other person will say, you know what, I could have handled it better also. And hopefully that's what comes of this, where everybody, you know, just says, you know what, we all dropped the ball on this. Let's go back out and get this one seed again and make it right. Yeah. All they have to do is ask each other to say, well, we're the Sixers. This is what we do. Like, <laughs> it's dysfunctional around yeah. here. So, like like I said, um, it's going to be really interesting to see this play out. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you this from the fans' perspective, because I've been mm -hmm. hearing, I actually, like, I tried to listen to some of the vitriol today, and mm -hmm. it was just so uninformed and uneducated and rebel rousing where it's mm -hmm. like you know how should as a fan how should you think the people of philadelphia handle this this is what i would say to fans because most fans are you know 30 40 and that like, i'm talking to them i'm talking to those fans that's going to be at the games that that may want to boo or may want to have vitriol towards ben simmons i say this you were 25 at one time you made bad decisions. You've done things that, you know, in hindsight, I wish I would have handled it different. You know, so if he comes back and he says, you know what, I could have been better. Then let's see how I play out. Let's see if, if, if he's going to shoot more. Let's let like much like with the Eagles. Let's see what it ha what happens before we just react and just. ah. I think a lot of times we forget how young these guys are. And I think we want them to be have the same output as us, you know, in your 40s and 50s, when, just think about when you were 24, 25, yeah. and the missteps, you yeah. know, and, and that's why there are phrases and words like live and learn, you know, get better, like, you know, allow it to happen. And the interesting thing is this, you know, um, if you got a boo, just when they announce him, get a good booing, get it out of your system, and then move forward. Yeah, don't, don't I don't curse believe at him and all that. Athletes, yeah. period. Yeah. But I think it's just idiotic. But that's just my personal belief. Now, um, having said that, you can be upset with him. Yeah. You can be disappointed. Yeah, so get you it know? out of your system once and then move forward. Yeah, maybe you don't cheer for him the first game. And that's your way of saying, you know, you hurt me or whatever. But it's, yeah. you know, to... to I, I heard at a wrestling show, you know, F. Ben Simmons and stuff like this. It's not necessary. Yeah, it's nonsense. That's not, and I'll tell you this, because yeah. that's not Sixers fans. Yeah. And this is the thing that people don't realize about Philadelphia. The reputation Philadelphia has, mm -hmm. it's mainly Eagles fans. It's the stadium. There's mm -hmm. stadium culture, mm -hmm. outdoor stadium culture, and mm -hmm. indoor stadium culture in Philadelphia. Oh, and don't, indoor don't stadium culture is way different. There's also flyer culture. Yeah, and the flyer step, <laughs> step for wise culture. Yeah. So there's like, and if you aren't a Philadelphia fan, it's really tough to understand this. Eagles culture is different than Philly's culture, even though they're very similar. Sixers culture and Flyers culture are radically different. And then the college team's cultures are radically different. Sixers culture is actually very supportive. Mm -hmm. Um, and they had Ben Simmons. So we'll see where this goes. I still feel the way I feel about Ben Simmons, but I'm going to just watch at this yeah. point as well. Um, and let's see if Kangaroo Jack, he's got the money <laughs> and he's not giving it back. So that's my obscure reference for today. <laughs> Speaking of obscure, mm -hmm. we thought the Eagles were going to go into obscurity, especially oh, after the, that first half. First three and quarters. Yeah. First three quarters. <laughs> and, you know, I'm watching the game and I'm talking to my friends and I'm just like, look, it's just hanging. Like the Panthers are just lead, letting them yeah. hang around. And when you let an NFL team hang around, we keep saying this. There's talent on this team. The problems are the, it's the coaching staff. Yeah, I, I think what you're seeing is just the, um, they're just green. For, you know, not just, you know, I know the Eagles, but they, they're just, they're raw. And it's like, they're finding their way through with the play calling, how to attack. And I, I think right now it's just like, the analogy I always like to, to use is when you're driving somewhere and you don't know where you're going. And, you know, but now with GPS, it's kind of easy, but, you know, you're looking at the signs. Is this the street I turn on? This and that. As opposed to when you're driving and you're just on cruise control. You just end up somewhere and you're just there. And I think right now, um, the coaching staff, they're driving, but they're, they're trying to navigate their way. They don't know exactly yeah. where they're going. Um, but kudos to them for sticking in there, you know, staying within striking distance and finding a way to pull it out. Yeah. My boy hurts. He's got, he's got a knack. Mm. He's got a knack for, you know, 
those key situations. He does come up. Um, I will say that. Um, my question is, are you worried about Sirianni a little bit? No, because like I said, he's raw. And, you know, I, I just think um, he comes off maybe as a little nervous or whatever, but it looks like they play for him. And that's the one thing that I always look for. It looks like they play for him. It looks like he has control of the locker room. And it's just about finding his voice and where he's comfortable at. I, I think he's still a little skittish about where he stands. Yeah. Um, the running game is the best friend of a young quarterback. I think I think he would be aware of this. Or are you saying just as a play caller, being nervous, being green, he just gets into this? See, I'm going to piggyback run. on something you said in a previous podcast where I, I think he's under a little bit of pressure to throw the ball. I think that's what they want. I think that's what management want the philosophy to be. And I think they hired him, letting him know we want to throw the ball if, if, if all things are even. And I think that's what you're seeing. Um, does he need to run the ball more? Absolutely. And hopefully this doesn't turn into another Doug Peterson situation where it feels like, you know, he has strings in his back. You know, hopefully he's his own man and he can go out there and call a game like he wants to. Because the thing that's always puzzling to me is his professional background is Indianapolis. And I guess his rabbi, for lack of a better term, is Frank Wright. Mm -hmm. So this is totally not how Frank Wright plays football. Yeah, you know, and so. that's why it's so incredibly confusing. That's the reason, like, we talked about, you know, you, we keep hearing these whispers that this is this is like Jeff Lurie. This, yeah. is a, this isn't even a Howie thing. This is a Jeff Lurie thing where this is what he wants and you're never going to get that big name coach ever again. Um, you're going to get guys like Sariani and there's a philosophy that's in place. For instance, I'll use as an example how the Eagles will never have linebackers. They're always going to get they're always going to get cute with the linebackers and one year deals for guys, stuff like that. Where there's a, there's a philosophy and a business model in place, and Jeff Lurie likes that. He likes having that, and it's a double edged sword winning the Super Bowl, you know, because you won the Super Bowl. That's great, greatest moment in Philadelphia history. But now here's the aftermath of that. See now, people who don't know you, you have a favorite word or term, and I'm going to use it right now. You're going to laugh, right? So what you're saying is it was fool's gold. <laughs> fool's gold, baby. <laughs> that Super Bowl was gold, uh, but you know, all of this other stuff is fool's gold now. Uh, where you're you're chasing something that you can only do once, and the teams like every Patriot team that won was a different team. If that makes sense. They had the same core structure, but those teams related differently. Sometimes they were more run oriented. Sometimes they were passing. The year they brought in Randy Moss and they had, you know, and they, they lost um, the Giants, but it was a different style you always, every year. You always make me defend the Eagles. And what I would say that it's unfair to compare them to that dynasty. I mean, that was something special. Yeah. What I, what I was, when, you, when you look at teams now, I, I would say this. It's important to have an identity. It's important to have something to lean on. And I'm not saying that you have to do it 100% of the time, but it's important to be able, when the chips is down, we can do this. or We know that. So hopefully, like I said, this is just an evaluation period, and hopefully by the middle of the season, they have some sort of identity. Yeah. Um, I think the offense has an identity. <laughs> like, air it out. You know, Hurts is going to make plays with his legs. They're putting a lot on a young quarterback. The mm -hmm. one pass where he threw the interception, where they're asking the tight end, Ertz, is running deep. Mm -hmm. And he's got to pit, put that ball between a corner and a safety. Mm -hmm. In his second year, in his 10th game in the NFL. Listen, it was a good throw, but <laughs> like, there, there, there there was a, but it was a good throw. Good. There was no, like, if yeah. like you're asking, like, Tom Brady, if you're Tom Brady, but that's a great said call. That he he did miss some easy throws. He did, and, and, and you know, so I um I gotta be even with it. like it was a, it was a great throw, but I would rather him make the throws that he should make. And if the spectacular happens, great. But that's the yeah. one. If you miss, I can live with that. It's it's a lot of things. I know how they say. I'm pretty sure it's a lot of plays that he wish he had back. Yeah, a young quarterback should be throwing around twenty to twenty five passes a game. And, and we know here, you know, as we say, living in the Northeast, you have to be able to run the ball. It's going to get cold. So I mean, at some point, Nick, you 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 have to be able to. It's run going to get ball. cold, Playboy. Like all the division teams is going to win against cold. Like we got Miles Sanders. He's, 
pretty good. I'm just saying. You got to stay in balance, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> never mind. You're big, dummy. No, you ain't going to do the Fred Sam. You're big, dummy. <laughs> like, but even then, he was just so thirsty for the ball. He's like, I'm trying to hit a home run. Yeah. Like, that's what he's doing because he didn't get the ball. And unfortunately, he's not going to get no rushing attempts this week. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, God. Oh. Yeah, so we're two two days away from Tampa Bay here. I got to decide whether or not I'm going to that because oh, that could get ugly fast. <laughs> I, I think, you know, I, of course, I think they're going to lose, but I think it'll be a competitive game. They they might give him a fight, but I don't know if it's worth getting home at two a.m. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, how many more chances you want to get to see Tom Brady? And it might be fun because it's the first time we've seen him since we beat him in the Super Bowl, right? So I'm pretty sure they got some some skits lined up and they ready just to you take a jab at. Oh yeah, that's, yeah, that's all you need is an angry inspired Tom <laughs> Brady <not>. against <laughs> against the when they when they went out the tunnel, you had Nick Foles. Like, How's everybody doing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> He uh, just yeah. yeah yeah so fifty six to three no fifty six no, no, to seventeen no, no, no. I think it's something where they'll pull away late I think it'll be a game mid third quarter late fourth I think it'll be kind of like the Kansas City game you know where it's like they're not out of it but they're not really in yeah, it and they shoot you know? themselves in the foot a couple yeah. dumb penalties Barnett to get two. 15 yeah. yards. This is the one where we're looking for a moral victory. Yeah. <laughs> give him a fight. Give him a fight, boys. Yeah, yeah. Our boys in green, and give him a fight. <laughs> yeah, and then after this one, the schedule lightens up a little bit. So if they can feel good about themselves after this, then who knows? Maybe they can run Two off a couple. And four, and the goal is, like, the schedule eases up to muddle around 500. Yeah, absolutely. If they muddle around 500, it's a successful season. In Absolutely. my opinion, Absolutely. Um, and and they progress. The quarterback progresses. The coaching staff gets better. Um, that's very important. So we will see Tampa Bay. Um, we'll see Super Bowl champs coming into town. We'll see. So uh, before we wrap things up, okay, let's get the closing thoughts. You were saying you had like you actually had something. Um, this John Gruden thing it really bothers me, and it bothers me for the simple fact of. The people who he was emailing, and these are the people who are doing the hiring. These are the people who are in charge of so many lives, and it's just disappointing. And this is why representation matters. This is why you need diversity. This is why we need diversity and ownership in all sports, because if you think this is an isolated incident, then you're sadly mistaken. It's not. It's systemic in the NFL. The NFL is a good old boys network. It absolutely mm -hmm. is. This looks the way Colin Kaepernick was treated. Absolutely. And, you know, and it's at times where I'm disappointed in myself because I feel as though I should have took a bigger stand and did more when the Colin Kaepernick thing happened. I feel like kind of guilty to continue watching the NFL and supporting it, seeing how he was treated. And then you, you see these emails and you know that this is just, you know, this is how they do business. Yeah, and this is this is – it's the boomer mentality. It's antiquated 1950s ideology. And you hear it. And that's, I'm, I guarantee you, I will guarantee, I will put, I bet my right arm, 90% of the NFL owners feel exactly the way Gruden feels. Right. Absolutely. I mean, he's actually. There's no doubt in my mind. He's emailing somebody that works for a professional, the Washington Redskins, the Washington football team. And the thing that's disappointing when you really think about it, they said that, the emails was coming from when he's working at ESPN. So are they checking their servers? And he's, he's able to do these things on ESPN computers. And now ESPN comes out and bash him afterwards. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's like everybody's complicit in this. And it's just like, we need representation. We need yeah. diversity. We, 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 we need a voice because like, like you said, if we see these, these handful of people doing it, how many more? Are doing it? And it's a perfect example of why it, you have to regulate things and why regulations like affirmative action exist in the first place. Cause you just would have these, these people mm -hmm. with this, this ideology and just no one can ever advance forward. It's, it's a tough enough struggle because of just, mm -hmm. you know, just the mentality that's in there. And, you know, I always believe this. I think that's the reason why black coaches, it, you know, most of the athletes are black. Mm -hmm. So obviously the head coaches, you know, if you have black coaches, it's, there's a relatability there. Yeah, it resonates. But these NFL owners, there's a reason why you have to put something like the Rooney Rule in place, which just gets you a, gets you a look-see. Mm -hmm. 
Honestly, yeah. it doesn't really do anything. And the reason for that is this, and I always say this, these owners do not want to, because these are billion dollar corporations, do mm. not think for a second that well, all these people who are loyal to this and you live and die, and when the Eagles lose, you're like seriously depressed. You are depressed because a corporate franchise mm. lost to another corporate franchise. Don't get it twisted. And these are billion dollar corporate franchises and these NFL owners do not want their CEOs because the head coach is the CEO in the face of that corporation to be black men. Okay. It's that simple or to have any form of diversity other than what is minimally required of them. Mm -hmm. And Gruden is just a small light on a systemic issue that has been around in this country. And the NFL is extremely reflective of this country. It's America's sport now. Mm -hmm. This is it. This is why we need fair representation. This is why people need to say. One of the reasons why we're doing this podcast, honestly, just to be completely honest with you. Absolutely. Because all the athletes are black, but you never hear black people other than jocks talk. You know, mm -hmm. so and whoop a dub -a -ba -ba, when they do talk, you know, you know, it's nothing where people are articulating themselves. So it's got to be real with that. Mm -hmm. You know what he said? It's just look, you got to do better. Got to do better. Just this country in general. People got to do better. Okay. Agreed. Agreed. Indeed. So obscure reference for today. Kangaroo Jack. Okay. <laughs> Look it up. Anthony Anderson's movie debut. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> Google it. It's Ben Simmons' story. All right. That is going to be it for the Philly Sports Dish. So, thank you for your time. Please follow us. You can pretty much reach us on every social media platform at this point Instagram, Evil Facebook. We're everywhere. YouTube. And um, check out our podcast, wherever you find your podcast as well. The best 20 minutes in Philadelphia sports from my main man, too. Thanks for the support. Yes, this is the one and only big game name. Thank you. Go Birds.